Okay, well, now we're going to start what for me is always the hardest part of this course when I have to try to make a sincere effort to explain the ideas of other people. I, you know, remember, I, I, Jean Paul Sartre is not my favorite philosopher, but he did have one good saying. Well, he had two, actually. Uh, the first one is hell is other people, l'enfer c'est les autres. Uh, anyway, I, I don't know about other people, but other philosophers, l'enfer c'est les autres philosophes. However, today I'm going to explain the ideas of a guy I actually admire enormously, Gottlob Frege. Uh, now, Frege oh, is a kind of heroic, legendary figure in analytic philosophy, uh, largely because he invented the subject. Uh, and uh, not only did he invent the subject, he invented uh, the philosophy of language as a subbranch within analytic philosophy. And he invented the one unique tool that analytic philosophers have that nobody else in the history of philosophy had, and that is mathematical logic. You get one of these. Um, also, uh, he is legendary because of his, uh, uh, so to speak, lonely and heroic existence. He taught in uh, Jena, which was not a great center of German culture even then, uh, and nobody paid much attention to him. Uh, it wasn't until he was discovered by Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein that he really became widely known. Uh, his most important project in life was to show that uh, mathematics, and in particular arithmetic, were really a part of logic. And in order to do that, he needed to show that you could derive mathematics from logic, and in order to do that, he had to reinvent logic, which he did. Uh, and there are, uh, 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 there are disputes about to what extent his derivation succeeded, but from his own point of view, uh, the great disaster was uh, the discovery by the then young Bertrand Russell of what became known as Russell's paradox. And the, the tragedy of the, the whole story is that Frege had finished his life's work, his great three-volume uh, work on the foundations of mathematics. What, what's the title of it? Gungesetze der Arithmetik. I forget. Don't quote me on the title of his three-volume work. But it was already in the press. It was in the hands of the publisher when he got a postcard from Bertrand Russell containing a contradiction containing a paradox. Uh, and I, I, this isn't really a course in this kind of crap, but I'll tell you the paradox anyway, because you ought to know it for your general education. If you're at a party and somebody asks you to explain Russell's paradox, if you're not too drunk, you'll explain it. Here's how it goes. Uh, Frege is going to show that numbers are really statements about sets. Uh, and consequently, he has to talk in an unrestricted way about sets. Uh, because basically uh, you can always count anything, and that's what numbers are for. They're to count with. Now, what is a set? Well, a set is defined by its members. So if you take the set of all cats, uh, that has every cat as a member. But you don't have to uh, take um, sets that are the extensions of well-defined predicate like cats. You can arbitrarily take uh, any bunch of uh, objects. So. Um, uh, this uh, hat, uh, this watch, and this thermos make a set. It has three objects, uh, three members in that set. Uh, so anything that you can identify, you can consider as a member of a set. Now, one of the interesting questions you get is, well, what about sets themselves? Can they be members of sets? Sure, why not? Uh, most of the uh, uh, sets we're interested in don't have sets of of uh, members, but no reason why you couldn't have sets as sets of members. You could have a set that include uh, the set of all prime numbers uh, and the set of all uh, numbers uh, smaller than four. Uh, so you'd have two sets within this set. Okay, but now I did get an interesting question. Well, can, can a set be a member of itself? Well, why not? Uh, most of the sets that we're interested in are not members of themselves. So the set of all cats is not a cat, right? So the set of all sets is not a cat. So the set of, uh, the set of cats is not a cat. Uh, so uh, the 
uh, the set of cats is not a member of itself. Uh, but it's easy to define a set that is a member of itself. Uh, take the set that includes all cats plus itself, right? That has one more member than the set of all cats. Everybody up with me? I don't, I don't understand this crap myself. I, I don't know. I don't know logic and mathematics. People I, I always point out to me as an example of a philosopher who, who never learned any logic. And as I think I told you, the only book on logic I ever read from cover to cover was one I wrote. And I'm assured by my friends that the book is a scandal. Uh, I wrote it with the help of a Belgian logician and mathematician. He, he's not here today. Uh, but in any case, uh, anyway, I'm going to explain this stuff to you. OK. So uh, because the set of cats is not itself a cat, it's not a member of itself. Everybody's got that. All right, but now there are sets that are members of themselves, because we can arbitrarily uh, specify a set that is a member of itself. I gave you a set that had three members. It had my watch, my hat, and my uh, water bottle. But add a member to that set, and we have another set that has itself as a member. OK, everybody's up with me. But now you get an interesting question. How about the set of all sets that are not members of themselves, right? Because you can take a set that's not a member of itself. Well, take the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. Now you get an interesting question. Is it a member of itself or not? Well, suppose it is a member of itself. Uh, then it follows immediately that it's not a member of itself because we just said it's the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. But suppose it's not a member of itself. Then it follows immediately that it isn't. It's only, you only get one. That's all right. You can be twins for the sake of the discussion. Um, I, it, it, if it's not a member of itself, then it follows immediately that it is a member of itself because we just said it's a set of all sets that are not members of themselves. Uh, and that's bad news in logic because that's a contradiction. Uh, and a contradiction is bad news. I'll tell you why it's bad news in a minute. Um, now, one way to understand the, this is called Russell's paradox, one way to understand the paradox is to compare it with the barbershop paradox. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, this is in the days when men still shaved or went to barbers to get shaved. Uh, there's a barber in Sausalito who shaves, he's a male barber who shaves all and only uh, the males in Sausalito who do not shave themselves. Now the question is, does the barber shave himself? Well, if he does shave himself, then it follows that he doesn't shave himself, because he shaves all and only those who do not shave themselves. On the other hand, if he doesn't shave himself, uh, which should I say first? Anyway, you get the same contradiction. If he doesn't shave himself, he does shave himself, because he shaves all and only those who don't shave themselves. If he does shave himself, he doesn't shave himself, because he shaves all and only those who don't shave themselves. OK, now the barbershop paradox is an old joke in philosophy, but nobody worries about it because you just point out you've given a self-contradictory definition of the barber. If you say he's a male in Sausalito who shaves all and only those who don't shave themselves, you, that's a self-contradictory definition. You can derive a contradiction from it. But the, the, uh, uh, the principle on which Russell's paradox is based is not in that way, obviously self-contradictory, it just says uh, you can arbitrarily uh, select uh, entities as members of a set. You can make a set by specifying. A set is defined by its members, so you can uh, 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 specify a set by specifying its members. And there's nothing in that axiom, that's an axiom of original or naive set theory, uh, that blocks the possibility of a set being members of themselves. Now, what's the way out of the paradox? Well. Uh, Frege thought there isn't any way out of it. He thought it was a total disaster. He tried to get a way out of it, but he thought that it ruined his life project, and he gave up on the project of, of uh, deriving mathematics from logic. Uh, most logicians have a way out of it. If you specify the axioms of set theory in such a way, uh, in a specific way, then you can't formulate uh, Russell's paradox. Uh, but I think that's cheating. I think Russell's paradox is a natural consequence of our ordinary way of talking. Anybody's theory of language has to say that a general term determines 
a set. The set, the word cat or the word horse uh, or the word mountain determines a set. It's the set of all cats or horses or mountains as the case might be. Uh, but if that's right, then it must make sense to answer the question, well, how about uh, the set itself? Is it a cat? Is it a horse? Is it a mountain? And the answer is no. But then is a set which are not, uh, is a set of the sets which are not members of themselves, that's a general term like any other, and that ought to determine a set. So what the hell is going on here? I, I think it's a scandal that we have not got a satisfactory solution to this paradox. Uh, most logicians don't give a damn about it because they've got a technical solution. They have a way of, of, uh, of axiomatizing set theory so that you can't state the paradox. But that's, I think that's a cheat. That's a bit like saying, well, please don't talk that way. Uh, and of course, you can always say that. In a way, Russell's way out of it was to get a, a theory, what he called the theory of types. And you couldn't then have self-predication. You couldn't predicate something of itself. You couldn't say meaningfully uh, that uh, a cat, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the set of cats is a member of itself, or the set of cats is not a member of itself. But I think that's a mistake. I think it's perfectly reasonable to talk about sets being uh, members or not members of themselves. So, for example, it makes perfectly good sense to say, if you enumerate all the cats in the world, you got them all together and you count them all up, well, the set of cats is not itself a cat. That seems perfectly, make perfectly good sense to me. Anyway, this was a great disaster. Uh, in Frege's life. I didn't intend to spend so much time on it, but um, I want you to see uh, that, it, uh, that uh, uh, Frege didn't just do the philosophy of language. He did the philosophy. He did mathematics was his main job. Uh, the philosophy of mathematics he thought was his main project, and he reinvented logic and invented the philosophy of language as sort of uh, uh, side effects, as, as something that he thought was important but really important mostly because it is a aided his main uh, purpose in, in uh, his intellectual life. Uh, it, it is a great feature of the uh, European artistic tradition that the same scene is painted by many different artists. So you've all remembers, uh, you all remember uh, different ways of painting the Annunciation. Uh, Raphael does the Annunciation quite differently from the way Giotto does the Annunciation. And you have very uh, luxuriant Annunciations uh, in different Renaissance painters. Now, I've often wondered how different painters would do Frege receiving the postcard from Russell that contains the contradiction that destroys his life work. And I guess the closest would be Monk's The Scream. Uh, would be the closest in Western art, but it'd be interesting to see how different people, how would Picasso have done it? Well, in any case, okay. Uh, so we're, we're now going to uh, go on to discuss uh, Frege's philosophy of language, of, of which the most important aspect is the distinction between sense and reference, between Sinn und Bedeutung in German, and just so you had something to take home in your hands, I've given you a handout sheet uh, now, the, the heading, St. Ken Zetze, Der Sprachphilosophie, uh, that's partly a private joke. Uh, Frege wrote something called St. Uh, Ken Zetze, Der Logik. Uh, uh, it wasn't St. Siebzehn Ken Zetze, Der Logik. 17 kernel sentences of logic. So I thought, what the hell? I'll give him uh, uh, 10 kernel sentences of language philosophy is what uh, that, the heading means. But if you don't like it, just cross it out. That's just my private joke uh, on Frege. Okay, so we're going to have these 10 propositions, and I'm going to get to them in a moment, but I want to give you his general conception. Frege was uh, uh, profoundly um, shaped in his thinking about language by what he thought was an absolutely fundamental principle of logic. Namely, if two things are identical, then any sentence that contains an expression referring to one will admit the substitution of an expression referring to another without changing the truth or falsity of the sentence, without changing the truth value of the sentence. Now, that's a very important principle. It's got different names. The most common name of it is Leibniz's Law. And in the simplest formulation, it comes out this way. It says, if x equal y, then if 
If x is identical with y, if these uh, x and y are identical, then any predicate true of x will be true of y. Um, and any predicate true of y will be true of x. So x is identical with y implies fx if and only if x, uh, fy. Or uh, I didn't put the universal quantifiers, but you could for all x and for all y and for all f. But any, whenever you have x is identical with y, then anything true of any feature of x will be a feature of y, and any feature of y will be a feature of x. Right? So everybody got that. Now that's about objects. Frege carries it a step further so that it is about expressions. And the principle here is whenever you have two expressions that refer to the same thing, then uh, you can use one uh, to, um, uh, you can replace one in the sentence with the other without changing the truth of the sentence. Uh, this is a, supposed to be a consequence of Leibniz's law. It is called the principle of substitutability. And the principle of substitutability is an important principle in logic because it is a test for whether or not substitutability substitutability. Um, the principle of substitutability is important in logic because it's a test for whether or not the sentence in question is extensional. And a sentence is said to be extensional or intentional with respect to substitutability, depending on whether or not you can make the substitution while preserving the truth value of the sentence. I don't know what uh, uh, Al Martinich includes in your readings, you know, in the, in the book that I asked you to buy. But in the original article, in the famous article, he puts this in Latin. Idem, he quotes Leibniz uh, Latin, because it's Leibniz's law. Idem, my, forgive my uh, Denver pronunciation of Latin. Idem sunt que sibi mutuo substitutui possent salva veritate. Identities are those which you can substitute for each other, saving truth. Salva veritate means saving truth. Okay, so keep that in mind. Keep Leibniz's law and substitutability in mind as we go through the principles of Frege's philosophy. And um, I'm going to say straight out that I think the whole tradition contains a very deep mistake. And I don't know how to rewrite the tradition uh, correcting this mistake, but here's the mistake. Everybody assumes that we're given an inventory of objects prior to developing language. That before you have language, you got this huge inventory of things. And indeed, you can't do quantificational logic without assuming that the variables of quantification, there is an x such that, and for all x such that, that they range over domains, classes, sets of objects. And I think that's a cheat. I think philosophically, now it's hard to say this precisely, but I think philosophically the situation is something like this. Our ability to discriminate something as an object and to count something as one object as opposed to another object and to count it as the same object on different occasions is a manifestation of the same cognitive capacity of which reference is a part. And you can't explain reference by presupposing objects without first answering the question, what the hell is an object in the first place? Now, this is me talking. This is not Frege. I promised myself I'd talk about Frege today, but I can't uh, resist um, uh, saying a little bit about what I think. What I think, I think this is a very deep point about language and the mind. It's perfectly natural to us to count this as one object. And I'm not objecting to that. That seems to be perfectly natural. But imagine a tribe 
that wasn't interested in this, but it was interested in this. And it goes around here and comes up like that. Okay, I didn't draw it very well. If you're up there, you can't see it. But I'm going to get it properly drawn. Okay. Now that object, we will give it a name. We'll call it a clerg. Okay. And we imagine a tribe in which clergs are very important, much more important than tables and chairs. Clergs are of religious significance. And a proper clerg, a sacred clerg, can only be constructed by sacred virgins working under water. So the clerg that I constructed was just an ex exemplary uh, ersatz, fake clerg for purposes of education. Okay, now does this make sense? I think it makes perfect sense uh, that you can easily imagine dividing up the world differently from the way that we in fact divide it. Furthermore, we imagine this tribe that to destroy a clerg, as I have just now done, I'm assuming it was a real clerg, which it wasn't of course, uh, there being no sacred virgins present, um, uh, that to destroy a clerg deserves the death penalty, right? Now that's a society that's different from ours. We don't much give a damn about clergs, but it's easy enough to imagine a tribe that did care deeply about clergs. Uh, so our way of dividing up the world is not inevitable. If we live the life of a conscious amoeba, uh, or for example, of a conscious galaxy, then it seems to me we might have a different way of dividing the world into objects. Now, a question I don't know the answer to, though we ought to be able to get the answer between now and, well, I won't say between now and Thanksgiving, but maybe between now and Christmas, would be, well, what is an object, anyhow? Uh, and that seems to me an interesting philosophical question. And all of these guys assume objects are given prior to language. And in a sense, that's right. My dog Gilbert can identify objects, but the cognitive capacity that he has for identifying objects is in the same line of business as the cognitive capacity that we have for referring to objects. And you can't use an inventory of objects to explain reference because the capacity for reference is part of the same capacity as the capacity for identifying objects. Now, if you didn't understand what I just said, don't worry. I don't understand it either. Uh, but I think there's something going on here that's important, and I'm going to come back to that. Now we're going to talk about Frege. Frege says it's very important in understanding language to see the difference between the sense of an expression and the reference of an expression. Socrates is bald. Uh, this refers to this guy, and I will draw a picture of him. Uh, and how does it do it? Well, uh, in each expression that is used to refer to an object, you have to distinguish between the expression and the sense of the expression, the meaning of the expression, the way we have of understanding the expression, and that sense, or zin, provides the mode of presentation of the reference. Sense gives you the mode of presentation. So if what I understand by, um, the, uh, by Socrates is the guy who invented the dialectic method in philosophy. I mean, um, Frege is usually given credit for inventing uh, Socrates is usually given credit for inventing it. Uh, so if that's who I mean by, um, the, uh, by Socrates, then my mode of presentation that is associated with Socrates will be that descriptive content, will be that description. And that will give us an identification of Socrates. And according to Frege, every uh, proper name uh, has a sense, and it's in virtue of that sense that it can refer to its bedeutung, its reference. Now, these are standardly translated, or were for a long time, as sense and reference. And that is a good uh, translation of the German. But the standard German, uh, tra uh, the, the, in, this, in standard German, bedeutung is another word for meaning. So I notice that in the current translations, they don't translate it as sense and reference. They translate it as sense and meaning. 
And this is a, su a subject of much dispute in analytic uh, philosophy. Um, uh, uh, Michael Dummett, who is a, the most famous interpreter of Frege and written, has written uh, huge books about Frege, insists that the right translation is reference. And there is an argument for that because at one point Frege does say, by bedeutung, he means bedeuten or benennen or bezeichnen, which would be roughly translated as uh, by meaning here, I mean meaning or naming or identifying, referring to, and that looks like it is the right translation. However, it gets a bit tricky when you go to the left-hand side. You go to the right-hand side of the sentence to the predicate part. Now, Frege saw something very deep, and that is uh, that the way this part of the sentence functions is really quite different from the way this part of the sentence functions. Uh, so if you take out in the sentence, Socrates is bald, and knock this out, so you have is bald. Well, that looks funny. So what we do is we put an X there to make it look like, I mean, it, it looks better on the page if you got something there. But of course, that's not a sentence. What remains is not a sentence. It's sometimes called an open sentence. And this is called a free variable. I want you to. Uh, Remember those expressions, kind of, uh, they're going to be important later on. There's an open sentence, and that x is a free variable. Now, that's important for his theory of quantification, which we're going to get to in a minute. But having identified this, having said, you know, there's something peculiar about this, the sentence is not a list. I mean, you can't make a sentence like this, Socrates, and then you list something else, baldness. That's not a sentence, that's just a list. So there's got to be something that makes this into a sentence and not just a list of words. And this is a, another deep problem in the philosophy of language. What accounts for the unity of the sentence? What accounts for the unity of the proposition? If it is indeed, remember our principle of compositionality, if it's made of these elements. So what constant, how does it all hang together as a single unified entity, which it plainly does? The sentence is not a jumble of words. The proposition is not a jumble of concepts. How does it all hang together? Now, Frege saw those problems, but then he seems to me he made exactly the wrong move. What he said is, well, just as Socrates has a sense, and in virtue of that sense has a bedeutung, so X is bald, that has a sense, and in virtue of that sense has a bedeutung. But what is the reference? What's the bedeutung of the predicate half of the sentence? What does is bald refer to? And its temptation to say is, well, it refers to baldness, or it refers to the property of being bald. That won't do, because if that were right, if is bald referred to the same thing as baldness referred to, then by Leibniz's law, which is what Frege should have had it tattooed on his forehead because he made his life out of it, uh, we ought to be able to substitute baldness for is bald. We should be able to cross that out and put in baldness, and you can't do that because it's not a sentence anymore. You've reduced the sentence to a list. You have destroyed the sentence. Now, any other philosopher would have said, well, I made a mistake. I, we shouldn't think of is bald as referring. The way the left-hand side of the sentence functions uh, to refer to an object is not at all the way the right-hand side of the sentence functions. It doesn't refer at all. Well, one of the marks of great philosophers is that what anybody else takes to be uh, a, a, mis a discovery mistake, uh, they think they've made a great discovery. Uh, Frege thought uh, he had discovered that there is a remarkable metaphysical fact about the right-hand side of the sentence. Namely, it refers to entities that are incomplete. And I don't know how to draw an incomplete entity except as a donut. Now, I know this picture is right because Frege used it, only he didn't put a donut here, but he should have be on his own account. It's got to be something incomplete so that this half can fit into that half to make a complete unity, and we're going to get to that unity in a second. 
Okay, so here's the situation Frege is in. He wants to say, just as the left-hand side refers, so the right-hand side refers. But he can't say it refers to uh, an entity like the property being bald or baldness, because then by Leibniz's law, you should be able to substitute. And you can't substitute because you destroy the sentence. So here's what he said. The right-hand side refers to a concept. But a concept is a very peculiar entity because it is essentially incomplete. Or as he says in another place, it's unsaturated, ungesetic. It's unsaturated. And whenever you try to refer to it with a noun, you fail because you refer to something else. You refer to an object, a Gegenstand and not a Begriff. So when you refer to it with a noun, you're no longer referring to the same thing. It changes into something else. It changes into a complete entity, an object, and not a concept. The concept must be incomplete in order that it can unite with the Gegenstand, with the object on this side of the sentence, to form a new unity, which, which is a truth value. Now, I haven't got to that, but well, let's go through this part of it so we get it right. This, the left-hand side of the sentence refers to an object. The right-hand side of the sentence refers to a concept. But there's a basic metaphysical distinction between concepts and objects, because objects are complete entities. Concepts are not. The concept is essentially incomplete. And it is incomplete in a way that makes it impossible to refer to it with a noun. If you refer to it with a noun, you're referring to something else. You're referring to an object. OK, now I, I, I'm going to stop for questions. I've discussed three absolutely crucial points uh, so far this morning. Uh, one is uh, Russell's paradox. I don't think you understand Frege's philosophy of mathematics. You don't. But you do. I want you to understand Russell's paradox and why it arises for anybody's theory of predication. Uh, secondly, uh, I've discussed Leibniz's law and why it's such a big deal in uh, philosophy. I, and I then discussed Frege's theory of the proposition. And his theory of the proposition is that a sentence contains two entities, a complete entity, the subject expression, and an incomplete entity. Uh, that, by sentence here, I mean a simple subject predicate sentence. They get more complexity with other kinds. But a simple subject predicate sentence, like Socrates is bald, or Barak is president. Uh, those com uh, uh, complain uh, an expression, the subject expression, that is a complete expression and refers to a complete entity. And they compla uh, contain an incomplete expression. X is bald. X is president. And that's an incomplete expression that refers to an incomplete entity, a concept. And it is the union of the complete with the incomplete that gives us the unity of the sentence. Now, his word for proposition is thought. Uh, so Gedanke in German equals thought in English, but it's his word for proposition. So whenever he says thought, uh, the whole uh, uh, what he means is what I mean by proposition. OK, I want to take questions about anything I've said so far, because now we're going to go to the whole sentence and the whole proposition. Everybody's up with this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, and let me show you the difficulty with that. The temptation is to get a kind of double vision there and say, instead of saying, well, look, you don't want to say Socrates' baldness, but you can say Socrates partakes of baldness, or Socrates instantiates baldness, or Socrates has the property of baldness. And won't that get you uh, off the hook? It won't, because now you've got more incompleteness there, namely instantiate, has the property of, uh, partakes of. All of those introduce the incompleteness all over again. Now, the pro does everybody see that point? I've, it's no good saying, well, you can get baldness over here uh, just by fiddling around a little bit. You can say Socrates has the property of baldness. And that's just another way of Socrates, saying Socrates is bald. But the problem with that is you've got the same difficulty all over again. What does this half of the, half of the sentence refers to? 
if this refers to Socrates and this chunk refers to baldness, what is, has the property of referred to? And Frege would say it refers to an incomplete entity, a concept, a begriff. The begriff is staring you uh, in the face again, and it's got the same incompleteness. And um, We're now in heavy-duty metaphysics of the kind that goes back to Aristotle and is a source of enormous confusion in philosophy. The problem you've just raised, as you probably know, is I call it the problem of universals. And there is uh, a great heavy-duty metaphysical question. Granted that Socrates exists, and granted that, uh, that uh, Barack Obama exists, how about baldness? Does, does baldness exist, and watch this metaphor, as something over and above all of the bald people in the world? There are all the bald people in the world running around. Is there also baldness in the world? And if there's baldness, uh, if there's a set of three bald men in this room, how about the number three? Does it exist in addition to all of the three membered sets? Well, I got to solve that problem for you too, but not this morning. Okay, we got to solve the problem of universals, the problem of the unity of proposition, the problem of predication, and the problem of Russell's paradox. It gives me a headache just thinking about it. And if this were a uh, of course, in the philosophy of mind, I'd say we, we got to solve the problem of headaches, but that's another issue. Let's take more questions. Yeah. Uh, this might be kind of similar, but if baldness is a concept and not an object, yeah. Then no, no, no. You can't say that. You cannot say baldness is a concept and not an object, because of course, baldness is a noun. It refers to an object. What you cannot, what you have, what you mean to say is, the expression X is bald does not refer to baldness, because baldness is an object. It does refer to something, an, an incomplete entity, which is a concept. Uh, it sounds more plausible in German. A begriff, that's concept, which is ungesättigt, uh, which is uh, unsaturated. Now, Frege says, you, you got to be sympathized with Fred, Frege, because he's the only German philosopher I know who tried to write clearly. I can actually read Frege in German with the help of a dictionary, because he tried hard to, uh, to write clearly. And at one point he says, listen, guys, give me a break. I, I'm trying to use language to explain all this stuff to you. And you got to, as he says, give me a grain of salt. That was his expression. Uh, when I, talk, when I, I tell you all this, what sounds like crap about incompleteness and all that, because that's just, I have to use words to talk to you, and this is the best I can do. OK, go ahead. Yeah, no, it is. Because if you say baldness is terrible, then you have referred to an object, namely baldness, and you have predicated of it is terrible. But is terrible now then refers to a concept, which is incomplete. So baldness is terrible. It gets the same analysis that that thing got, and we got a complete thing here, which is baldness. This is supposed to be the top of a bald head, I guess. Um, <laughs> but over here, you got the same problem all over again. This has to have a hole in it that that, uh, that, that can fit in. These are my metaphors, not Frege. As far as I know, Frege never saw a donut in his life. Uh, they were not common in 19th century Germany. Incidentally, I can't resist uh, a bit of a sociological commentary here. Uh, uh, probably the most intellectually self-confident culture uh, in recent intellectual history uh, is a, a German university culture of the late 19th century. Uh, they really thought they were the top of the world. Uh, they thought German culture was the greatest culture that ever existed, and the greatest part of German culture was its intellectual culture, and the greatest part of the intellectual culture was the university culture. And if you go, as I did, and read this stuff in the original, uh, when I first started getting interested in this, there, were, there weren't translations of some crucial works. And I used to go to the Mathematics Institute in Oxford and read these wonderful leather-bound volumes on beautiful paper. Of the, uh, and the title of them, I remember best, was The Königliche Gesellschaft, Gesellschaft für Wissenschaft und Mathematik Physische Klasse. That is, the Royal Saxony Society for Science and Mathematics, the class of physics, or the physics section. 
Uh, and they, they, they had a wonderful uh, intellectual self-confidence. And indeed, until um, the Second World War, well, until Hitler uh, came to power, I, it was universally believed that the best education in the world was in Germany, and it probably was. Uh, and I, the Germans certainly were, uh, well, I mean, another proof. Until Hitler came to power, Germany received twice as many Nobel Prizes as the whole of the United States. Uh, uh, now, since then, it's all different. But until 1933, uh, Germany had a kind of intellectual self-confidence. Uh, they lost some of it after the First World War, but certainly Frege Wright wrote in a period of enormous intellectual self-confidence. Uh, and by the way, Frege was himself a fanatic uh, right-wing nationalist of a kind that offends many of his followers today. You know, I don't give a damn about his politics. If it turned out that, that, all this, that Adolf Hitler was really a Frege in disguise and, and he made all these great discoveries, well, fine, let's get on with the discoveries. I don't care about the personality of the guy. But anyway, Frege himself uh, had uh, uh, features that distress many of his uh, uh, contemporary American admirers. Okay, uh, that's a footnote. Uh, other questions? Yeah. You say it louder. Um, I'm having difficulty with the fact that it's a problem that the set cannot be a part of itself. Yeah. With its like set all sets that aren't the list itself. Yeah. Like the, the first proposition you can make sense that it can't be a part because it can't by definition. So what, what's the problem? Here's the problem. If take any predicate, is a horse, is a dog, is a cat, is a number, then that predicate will determine a set. The, a predicate divides the world in two. It divides the world into those things that satisfy the predicate and those things that don't. So the predicate is a horse divides the world in two. All of the horses and all of the rest of the world. Now those, the, the division into two determines sets. They're the set of all horses and the set of all non-horses. Okay, but now then it must make sense to ask, uh, is each set a member of itself? And in those cases, it's not. If a predicate divides the world in two, then the predicate is a set which is not a member of itself must also divide the world in two, right? Those, set, those things that are sets that are not members of themselves and those things that are not sets that are members of themselves. Okay, but and that so far no nothing's wrong. Everything is all right. Every predicate determines a set. Sets have members, and I, the predicate is a set that is not a member of itself. Is a predicate like any other. It must divide the world into two. But that predicate immediately produces a contradiction, because that determines a set which is such that if it's a member of itself, it's not a member of itself. And if it's not a member of itself, it is a member of itself, and that is a disaster. Now, why is it a disaster? Well, here's why. If you get a contradiction uh, in logic like this, if you have P and not P, well, you know immediately that that implies whenever you've got P is true, then P or Q is true. But if you've got P or Q and not P, then you can infer Q. So it means from P or not P, you can invert, uh, I, let me go through all the steps. You can invert, uh, and let me spell it out more slowly. P and not P implies P, because every conjunction implies every conjunct. Okay, but P implies P or Q, and P and not P implies not P, but the combination of either P or Q and not P, that implies Q. Okay, has everybody got this? Now why is that such a disaster? Because Q is any proposition. A contradiction implies anything. A contradiction will imply uh, uh, that uh, uh, Barack Obama is 17 miles tall, uh, that the United States is entirely made of green cheese, uh, and that two is a number larger than 3,000. Okay, all of those are ridiculous, but that is a consequence of the contradiction. Because P or not P implies P, P implies P or Q, and P, uh, and P and not P implies not P, and P or Q and not P implies Q. So you can derive any 
proposition from a contradiction. You don't want contradiction. They're very bad news in logic. Now, you might say, well, who gives a damn about logic? But the problem is, if you're trying to do a serious philosophical investigation of mathematics, you have to take that seriously. OK, all of these are good questions. Any other question? Yeah. Yeah. Form and all. But to me, baldness still seems like a concept. It's an object by this yeah. definition, but it still seems like a concept. No, I, I, let me repeat your question. It's a good question. Uh, she said, look to her, baldness seems like a concept. And it does. And Frege would say, that's absolutely right. It's perfectly good English or a perfectly good German to talk about the concept of baldness. But now here's the problem. On Frege's account, the concept of baldness is not a concept. It's an object, right? That looks like a contradiction. And he admits it does. His example was horse. He said, look, on my account, the concept horse is not a concept. What is it? It's an object. But that's where he says, give me a grain of salt. I'm trying to use language to talk about itself. It wasn't designed to talk about itself. So the concept of baldness is not a concept, looks self-contradictory, and Frege admits that it looks self-contradictory, but this is an unfortunate feature of language, he said. He hated ordinary language. That was just awful, ordinary language. Uh, the concept of baldness is not a concept. It's an object. Uh, but then uh, how do you refer to the concept of baldness? You cannot refer to it with a noun phrase because you immediately transform it into something else, an object. Uh, the thing about Frege is if you get interested in it, 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 it has a kind of um, obsessive quality to it. It has a certain charm. It's a bit like Wittgenstein's Tractatus I mean, you can, or, or Dostoevsky's novels. Uh, you can get so wrapped up uh, in, in, the, uh, in the drama that you forget about the real world. But in, in any case, in Frege, this makes perfectly good sense to say the concept of baldness is not a concept. It couldn't be, because it's a complete entity. We just referred to it with a noun phrase. So it's got to be an object. It's a Gegenstand. Yes? So is the problem just grammar, then? I mean, That's what Frege thought. If we, if we all agree that the concept of baldness seems to be a concept, but in, in, our, language, in our grammar, it's, it's an object, but it's not really an object. It's just the well, the point is, the concept of baldness I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> even I can't say it. The concept referred to by the right-hand side of this sentence, by the open sentence, X is bald, I, is not something that can be referred to with a noun phrase. Why? Because a noun phrase is complete and refers only to complete objects. Gegenstände, that's the plural of Gegenstand. Uh, whereas what we're trying to do is get something incomplete, and to refer to that, you have to have an incomplete expression, a predicate expression. Uh, and you've got to admire Frege, because he did it all by himself, and it's pretty gutsy. When, the rest, when what looks the rest of us like a contradiction, Frege thought it was a great discovery. It reminds me, uh, the mark of, a, in, in, uh, of the good marketing in technology is uh, it, when you discover a uh, 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 flaw in the system, you declare it to be a feature. Uh, I once had an answering machine made by a Panasonic or some Japanese outfit, and it had a lousy uh, a chip so that uh, the recording was awful, your voice recording. And it said in the instructions, uh, an additional feature of this system is it disguises your voice. <laughs> And I thought, well, some marketer probably made a lot of money for that great discovery. The, f the, the flaw of Frege here it says is a great discovery. I've discovered that you cannot refer uh, to uh, concepts with noun phrases, because then they would turn into something else, namely objects. Yes? Well. All right, but this is the problem of universals. When you talk about baldness, not about individual bald guys, but about the property baldness, what are you talking about? And I have to answer that question. I'm not going to answer it this morning. Do universals exist? And how about numbers? This was Frege's great obsession. He thought, here we are, the summit of human civilization. Indeed, the great philosopher Hegel had declared 
uh, uh, contemporary Germany to be the summit of human history. Uh, I mean, Frege did not admire Hegel, of course, but I, I'm being sarcastic here. Uh, uh, the, but here we are, and nobody knows what a number is. Here we've gone thousands of years using numbers, and it's a scandal, says Frege, that nobody knows the answer to the question, what is a number? And I'm going to tell you the answer to that question. Uh, okay, so, uh, but that's an, a special case, the question, what's a universal? In addition uh, to all the bald people, is there also a universal baldness? In addition to all of the square things, is there a universal squareness? And so on with all of the other universals. And how many, if there are, if universals do exist, uh, are, uh, how many of them are there? How do you count them? Uh, and this was, I think, now here I'm on shaky historical ground, I think this was a very important uh, question in the Middle Ages. It wasn't just a casual issue. The issue is something that's called realism about universals. Do you think real, universals have reality? Uh, and in the Middle Ages, uh, so the story goes, this was very important because in order to make sense of the Eucharist, uh, you had to assume uh, that uh, the, the blood, uh, the, uh, the uh, wine and the uh, bread took part of the universals of the body and, and uh, the blood of Christ. Uh, and I, I, I don't know enough about church history to know if that's correct. But I'd be worth your looking it up, because, uh, but this is a story that uh, it's, uh, I, I heard it in some university lecture, so it's probably false. But in any case, uh, that worth, would be worth checking out, that, this, that the problem of universal loomed large in the Middle Ages. In, in the Middle Ages, there was a big dispute between realism, where the realists thought Universals have a real separate existence. And nowadays, realism is sometimes called Platonism because Plato is supposed to have invented the idea uh, that, it, that in addition to all of the uh, virtuous acts, there is a universal of virtue. He called it a form. Uh, Plato believed that there existed forms, which were the idealized abstract entities of universals. So realism was opposed to nominalism, which says, no, there's nothing that all bold things have in common. There's no universal that they all share or partake of. We just use the same word for all of them. And then there was a sort of an intermediate view called conceptualism, which says, no, uh, there is a concept uh, which is not a sort of realistic universal, but it's more than uh, the act, uh, more than just the commonality of the use of the word. Uh, I think the whole issue is hopelessly confused, and I hope to sort it out. Well, let's say before Thanksgiving, at least. I mean, this one for Christ's sake, we ought to be able to solve that one, even if we can't solve Russell's paradox. Uh, okay. Any other questions? All these are good questions. Okay, let's go on then. We get, the situation gets hairier. Here's how it goes. Because, Frege says, the noun Socrates has a zin, a sense, which provides the mode of presentation. And in virtue of that mode of presentation, it refers to an object. And the object here is a Gegenstand. That's German for object, a Gegenstand. Okay, here this has also has a sense, and that's just the ordinary meaning of X is bald, and it refers to an entity, but the entity is not a Gegenstein, it's a Begriff. It's a concept, and that's an incomplete entity. What about the whole damn sentence? And Frege says, yes, the whole sentence also has a sense. I don't know if I can write this on the blackboard. It has a sense, and what is the sense of the, whole of, of the whole sentence? It is a proposition. The sense of a whole sentence is a proposition, and the sense of the whole sentence provides you with the mode of presentation of what? Frege says, with the true or the false. It, prevents you, it presents you with either truth or falsity, and that, we, thanks to Frege, we have come to call a truth value. A truth value is either uh, true or false. And entire sentences, 
express propositions. The word that he uses for proposition is gadanka, which means thought. The entire sentence expresses a proposition. The proposition provides the mode of presentation of either truth or falsity, depending on whether or not the sentence is true or false. Now we get to this great document that I've prepared for you. God, it took me an hour to get to it, but here we go. Um, I want to go through it. In general, okay, everybody's got the handout sheet. In general, a sign expresses its sense, zin, and refers to its reference, bedeutung, sense determined. Reference, reference is in virtue of sense. And that's because, uh, well, we'll get to that, the sense provides the ach des gegebenseins, the mode of presentation. Okay, for singular terms, that means a, a noun phrase in the singular, like the man, as opposed to the men. Uh, the man, or the dog in the corner, or, or Socrates, or Barack Obama. For singular terms, and he uses Eigennamen, which literally in German means proper names, he uses that for all singular terms. The reference is an object, and the sense provides the mode of presentation of the reference. For predicate expressions, the reference is a concept, and the sense is the ordinary meaning of the expression. For whole indicative, or as we say in America, declarative, indicative is the English for uh, declarative. For declarative sentences, the reference is a truth value, and the sense is a proposition, a gadanka. Objects are complete, concepts are incomplete, truth values are objects. He says, if the sentence is true, then it refers to the circumstance that it's true. It refers to the truth. He actually says that. Das wahr and das falsch. He thinks all false sentences refer to the same thing, the false, and all true sentences refer to the same thing, the true. All right, now he makes... All right, just to look ahead a, a bit, what I'm going to say is uh, he's right about this part. Uh, the proper name refers to an object in virtue of the sense or content that people associate with it. But I think he's wrong in saying that there's anything that stands to this half of the sentence the way that the guy stands to that half. And I think he's wrong in saying that the whole sentence refers. This is the entire sentence. And this is, its sense is a proposition. And it refers to the circumstance that is true or the circumstance that is false. OK, but now he makes another deep claim, and we're up to number three in, uh, on your handout sheet. There's an analogy between function expressions in mathematics and incomplete expressions in natural language. So for example, the functional expression x squared plus x names a function. Both the expression and the function it names are incomplete. The expression can be completed with the name of a number. The number is then, and this is standard mathematical jargon, jargon is an argument of the function. And the fu function now determines another number as value. So you, you're all familiar with this, but I want to remind you. Functions take arguments and produce values. So the function x squared for the argument 2 produces as value 4. And that's just a fancy way of saying x uh, 2 squared is identical with 4. But I want you to remember that because Frege makes an interesting analogy. He says, if you take an expression like the capital of x, that's a function expression, just as x squared is a function expression. And here, if you put in 2 as your argument, you get 4. Here, if you put in uh, uh, France as uh, the place in place of the, of the variable, uh, if you put the argument France for the variable in the, in the function, you get as value uh, Paris, because Paris is the capital of France. If you put in England, uh, you get uh, London, because London is the capital of England. If you put California, you get Sacramento, because Sacramento is the capital of California. So Frege sees an analogy between function expressions in mathematics. He was a mathematician, after all. And 
uh, ordinary English, ordinary uh, language, English or German, uh, definite descriptions like the capital of uh, California or the capital of France. If you knock out uh, the term there, you have an incomplete expression, the capital of X, and that is a function expression which for different arguments will take different values. But now we can now redefine our notion of a concept. A concept is a function whose value is always a truth value. So the expression x is bald refers to a concept, but that, remember, is a function. And for a given argument, Sam or Socrates, it has a truth value, either the true or the false. So just as x squared is a function, and for the argument 2 takes the value 4, and the capital of x is a function, and for the argument California takes the value, value Sacramento, so x is bald is a function, and for the argument Socrates, assuming Socrates is bald, it takes the value truth, or as he says, the true, either the true or the false. A concept, he just told us, was the reference of a gr grammatical expression. For this reason, the expression the concept bald does not refer to a concept, it refers to an object. By completing a concept expression, we create a sentence. A sentence is, a, a, you take a concept expression such as x is bald, uh, or, or uh, x is the square root of four, uh, and you put in a, 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 you complete it by putting in a noun for the x, and then you have a whole sentence. Concept is a, re it looks like he's given us two definitions of concept. A concept is the reference of a grammatical predicate, and a concept is a function whose value is always a truth value. That it looks like those are different, but in fact they give exactly the same result. Because by completing a grammatical predicate with the, a name of an object, uh, you, uh, uh, you provide an argument for the function and now the function will take a value, either the value true or the value false. So you can say either the concept is the reference of a grammatical predicate, or you can say a concept is a function whose value is always a truth value. Okay, now we go to Frege's greatest, well, a lot of people think his greatest discovery, and that is his uh, invention of the predicate calculus. And his invention of the predicate calculus rested on having a different conception of language than the one that people had had going back to Aristotle. In Aristotelian logic, all men are mortal, some men are mortal, Socrates is mortal. All of those are of the same form. They're the subject predicate form. Frege saw that's wrong. The way Socrates is mortal functions is quite different from the way all men are mortal, some man is mortal function. There was always an embarrassment for the Aristotelian view. How about no men are mortal? Uh, how the hell does that work? If Socrates refers to Socrates and all men refers to all men and some men refers to some men, what does nobody, no man, what does that refer to? Well, that was an embarrassment, and Frege got us out of that embarrassment. So take, uh, I, I, what, what case did I use here? Um, if we take, uh, Soc I've been using Socrates and bald. If we take Socrates is bald, and we knock out Socrates, we get x. And now that's no longer a sentence. This is an incomplete expression. But now watch. You can complete it by adding there is an x such that x is bald. And we now use this notation for that. There is an x such that x is bald. Now look at this. We had an incomplete expression, an open sentence, something that was not a sentence at all. But you can complete it not only by sticking the name of a guy in there, but by putting a quantifier. And Frege says that you can say 
there is an X such as bald, or you can say for all X, uh, X is bald, everybody is bald, by putting in the name, uh, by putting in the name of the quantifier function, there, uh, there is an X such that, or for all X, X is such that, you completed the original not by naming an object, but by referring to another function. So existence, says Frege, is a second level function. It's a begriff, all right, but it's a zweite Stufe. It's an upstairs function. It's a second level function. Now, that doesn't sound like it's a very big deal, but it's very important in the entire history of philosophy because it makes it clear why existence is not a predicate like any other. See, uh, people are willing to say, well, existence is not a predicate. Uh, Kant famously said that. But grammatically, it obviously is. Horses exist, uh, exist their functions as a predicate. What he meant was it's not a predicate of objects. What is it a predicate of? It is a predicate of concepts. And the sentence, horses exist, says there is an X such that X is a horse. And what that tells you is that the concept, and I'm going to talk in Frege talk now, the concept horse has instances. Now this is immensely important in the history of philosophy because there's a very bad proof that has a very long history. It's called the ontological proof for the existence of God. It was originally invented by Saint Anselm in when? When did Anselm lived in the ninth century? Check that out on Google, your scholarly resource here. I, 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 Saint Anselm invented a notorious proof for the existence of God, and here's how it went. God is that being greater than which cannot even be thought. Okay, now ask yourself, does God exist or not? Well, suppose he doesn't exist. Then something greater could be thought, right? The same guy only existing. Sorry about that. I, I call him a guy. Uh, an entity. Uh, then the, uh, the, there, uh, then the, uh, an entity could be conceived greater uh, than that, namely the same entity only existing. Uh, and you'd be surprised how, what a long and prodigious history this was. And in Descartes cleaned it up a bit, but it's just as bad in Descartes. In Descartes, here's how it goes. God is that being who, by definition, is perfect. What is a perfect being? Well, obviously, a perfect being is a being that has all of the perfections, right? Okay, now ask yourself, does God exist or not? Well, it follows immediately God must exist, because if God didn't exist, then he would certainly have one very grave imperfection, namely non-existence. That's a hell of an imperfection, non-existence. Uh, so God must exist, otherwise he would ha we wouldn't satisfy the definition. By definition, God exists. And the way this is supposed to work uh, rhetorically is this. Take the atheist the fool who hath said in his heart there is no God, and ask him, define your terms. What do you mean by God? And he has to agree. God is, by definition, a perfect being. And what is a perfect being? What does that mean? Well, it must mean a being that has all the perfections. Now ask yourself, does God exist or not? Assume he does not exist, then you get an absurd result. God would have an imperfection, non-existence. Ask, any, ask the whole class, who would prefer existence to non-existence, or non-existence to existence, and you'll get the result that existence is definitely, I mean, there may be a couple of suicidal nuts in the class, but in general, you'd get the result uh, that uh, existence is a perfection. But since God has all the perfections, God must exist. Now, throughout history, people have been suspicious of this. Aquinas, to his credit, saw that it was fishy. And uh, Kant said, existence isn't a predicate. Oh, yeah? Why not? I mean, it certainly is grammatically a predicate. What he should have said, and what Frege enables us to say, which nobody could say before, existence is not a property of objects. If I'm asked to list the properties that an object has, I cannot list existence. I'm, I, I write letters of recommendation uh, all the time, and how, God. 
Uh, um, and so I write a letter and I say, uh, Sally is very hardworking and produces uh, uh, cogent and original essays in her philosophy classes, and she exists. <laughs> There's something fishy about that, um, because all of the stuff that I wrote before presupposes her existence. So what is existence? It is not a property of objects. And now, you can't, uh, for reasons Frege gave us, you can't just say flat out, it's a property of concepts. But what you can say is every statement of existence is a statement about a concept. Because when I say there is some x such that x is ball, that says ball things exist, that says this concept has instances. The concept is instantiated. Uh, so what happens in existential statements when I say horses exist? Uh, the subject part expresses a concept. And the predicate part tells you whether or not the concept has instances. Now let me go through this slowly in a way that Frege didn't, but I think I want to make it clear to you. Take sentences of the form horses exist or dogs exist uh, and ask yourself how do they work. Well, the first thing you can say is existence is not a property of objects. But then another way to say that is in existential statements such as horses exist, the subject expression does not refer to objects, and then the predicate expression says of them whether or not they exist. The subject expression can't refer to objects, because if it did, uh, then you'd have to presuppose that the statement was true in order to state it. You see, if you think horses exist refers to horses and says of them that they exist, then you've got to suppose horses exist in order that you can refer to them. So two ways of saying the same thing. In existential statements, the predicate of statement doesn't ascribe a property to an object or objects, but the subject expression, horses exist, doesn't refer to an object or objects. Well, what's going on in existential statements? Frege was the first person to see that. I, and what he says is, what's going on is that in horses exist, the expression horses expresses a concept. And the, and the predicate expression exists tells you whether or not there are any instances of that concept. Or as he puts it, existence is a second level concept. Existence is not a property of objects, but you can't say this quite in Frege, but you can see what it's trying to say. Existence is a property of concepts, or rather, as Frege put it more carefully, any statement of existence is a statement about a concept. It says that the concept has or does not have instances. Horses exist and dragons do not exist. Each of those expresses a concept and then says whether or not the concept has instances. Now this is going to be very important for Frege's whole philosophy of mathematics because the quantifier expressions, there is an x and for all x, x is such that, those are referred to concepts at the second level. Begriff of the zweite Stufe. I, I always forget if it's der zweite Stufe or zweite Stufe, but anyway, it's a zweite Stufe up there. I, I, my German is pretty imperfect, as those of you who speak German will have noticed. Uh, okay, so we've, this is an important discovery, and now he's going to go on and say, now, number expressions are also second level expressions. Every number is a complete object. But of course, statements of number, there are six horses in the barn. What the six there does is refer to a concept. And the statement, there are six horses in the barn, says the concept horse in the barn is six times instantiated. So six there is a predicate not of an object, but of a predicate horses in the barn. And it says that concept, horses in the barn, is instantiated six times. OK, now this is actually a deep and important discovery. That the quantifier expressions, for all x, x is such that. Uh, and the existential quantifier, there is an x such, uh, such that. And number expressions, like 5 and 4 and the square root of, of uh, 8, I, all of those are concept expressions, but at the second level. They're uh, um, uh, concepts of the zweite Stufe, of the second level, because they take as arguments 
not actual ground level objects like dogs and cats, but other concepts. Okay, so for the first time in Frege, we get an analysis of existential statements. Now look, I didn't even get all the way through this, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, I got a, enough time to get through the rest of this, I, uh, I think. Where are, are we? We're up to the uh, uh, back page. Uh, so there is an x such that x is a horse, or in, in quantifier expressions, there is an x such that horse x. By the way, the notation that we use, this uh, backward uh, e and the upside down a, uh, that's not due to Frege. Frege had an elaborate diagram, and people who've learned it say it's lovely. You know, they talk about it the way people talk about Apple computer. I mean, uh, they think it's just wonderful. I've never used one, so I don't know. Uh, but in any case, uh, what we now use is a notation that was originally invented by Giuseppe Paiano, a great Italian logician. And he didn't actually use uh, the upside down x, but uh, basically the notation that we use for quantification is due to Payano. Okay, now we get to another important claim in Frege, which has very, been very influential. Expressions with the same reference can be substituted for each other without loss or change of truth value. That's Leibniz's law, and you know that now. But in indirect contexts, that is, sentences preceded by such words as Sam believes that or Sally said that, word have the, words have their indirect sense and their indirect reference. The indirect reference of a sentence is its customary sense, a thought, and its indirect sense is the sense of the words, the thought that or the proposition that. So what we really mean when we, when we say Sally believes that Socrates is bald is Sally believes the proposition that Socrates is bald. But now that has a weird consequence, namely words systematically change their meanings and their reference when they're prefaced by something, Sally said that, John believes that. All of those produce indirect context, and because of the indirect context, you have an indirect sense. Ungerader Sinn. I love speaking German in public because it sounds authoritative. Ungerader Sinn und ungerader Bedeutung. Because you get an indirect uh, sense, you get an indirect reference. And the indirect reference of a word is its customary sense. So really, when you say uh, John believes that Barack Obama is, is president, uh, Barack Obama there doesn't refer to Barack Obama. It refers to the sense of the expression Barack Obama. And this is one of those great disasters in the history of philosophy that we're still recovering from. Okay, well, we pretty nearly, uh, well, let's see, we didn't quite get through that. All right, <clears throat> now we're going to get his, um, uh, his conception of uh, 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 of compositionality, but I want to, uh, before we, uh, we still got one or two minutes, don't we? Uh, I want to introduce a couple other notions. Uh, Frege says the key to understanding language is sense and reference, but there are two other notions he introduced that are important. He had a kind of primitive notion of illocutionary force, and he even used the notion of force. He says, the force of the sentence, leaves the room, leave the room, addressed to John, will be different from the force of John will leave the room. Uh, both have the proposition that John will leave the room, but the first has the force of an order, and the second, uh, John will leave the room, has the force of a statement. So there was a kind of very primitive notion of illocutionary force, and I've often wondered if Austin didn't get the idea from Frege because he knew, he actually translated an important book of Frege into English. Another notion that Frege had, which is important, is the notion of tone. And Frege says the sentence, John is poor and John is honest, have the same sense and reference as John is poor but John is honest, but the word but lends a different tone there. There's a kind of contrast implied by the but, which you don't get with and. The meaning is the same. The reference of, of and is the same as but, because it's true that John is poor but honest. Is a, will be a, a, a truth of John is poor but honest will be exactly the same as the truth 
uh, truth conditions of John is poor and honest. But the flavor, the tone is different because with but you imply a contrast. And it's very interesting that we do have these words that don't affect truth but are function crucially in language. Other languages have them. Uh, the, the favorite German is doch. Uh, and if you speak German, I'd like you to explain how the hell, what doch means anyhow. There are lots of books written about what doch means. Nobody knows. And the French have a wonderful word used to express disagreement. Si. Mais si, meaning you're dead wrong uh, about that. Okay, I'll go on with all this on Thursday.